Hey, recently I was asked about uh, using a modern digital oscilloscope and its FFT or fast Fourier transform function to try to characterize the different tonal qualities of say, electromechanical devices. And uh, so I thought I'd do a little video on it because it's kind of an interesting topic. Um, one of the advantages, many advantages, of uh, modern digital scopes is that they've got the ability of doing some advanced math, and one of them is a Fourier transform, which allows you to look at the frequency domain content of a signal, a complex signal. Um, and, and this function goes back in, uh, to, you know, even that, this uh, nine-year-old nine uh, tech uh, TDS-2014 has got a, an FFT function in it as well, so they've been around quite a long time. But the scope I'm going to use here is a, um, a more modern Tektronix uh, 4000 series. This happens to be an MDO 4104-6. But uh, we're not going to use the spectrum analyzer input here because we're going to concentrate in this case on audio frequencies, which is uh, you know, below the minimum frequency for the spectrum analyzer. So we're going to use an FFT function. So before we do that, let's do a quick little review of how scopes do the FFT and what that means. So the oscilloscope essentially captures data over time by sampling it, okay, at some sample rate, and basically getting some data samples and capturing that over time. So typically looking at voltage over time, okay. Um, and basically that record of data is then processed with the fast Fourier transform to give you the frequency domain result. So how does, you know, what you get in the frequency domain result relate to how this data was captured? And that's typically things that to confuse most people. So let's see if we can kind of cover it pretty quickly here. Uh, so again, we're the, the scope samples data over time, okay? And uh, how, this, how, this, how you set the scope up is going to determine what we get in the frequency domain. And here's the, the two major things. One thing that people think about is, okay, what frequency range am I looking at on the output of the FFT? And the FFTs in the scope typically range from about DC out to one half the sample rate. Okay, so whatever sample rate was captured in this waveform, and that may be, you know, the maximum sample rate of the scope, or the scope may be set up so that the effective sample rate of this waveform is less than that. But whatever that sample rate is, okay, that we're sampling data in in this captured waveform one half of that sample rate will be the highest frequency that you see out of the FFT. So one of the things you want to do is set up the scope such that the sample rate being used for that waveform okay, is going to give you essentially you know, be sufficient to look at the highest frequency you want to look at. In our case we're going to be looking at audio so I would say you know somewhere around 10 kilohertz as our maximum frequency here 10 12 kilohertz would be fine. So setting up the scope such that the effective sample rate on the waveform is, you know, 25 kilohertz, it would be sufficient for audio. Okay, so that's what we're going to do there. Now the other thing is, what kind of resolution do you have? Okay, how 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 well can you resolve very closely spaced signals? That's called frequency resolution. On a spectrum analyzer, okay, it's typically the resolution bandwidth, but in an FFT, it's typically kind of a, a bin spacing, and what that resolution bandwidth, what that bin spacing is, um, or that frequency resolution is, is going to be related to the duration of the record that we've grabbed. So how long of a record did we grab over time? Okay. So for example, if we captured this at, you know, say 10 milliseconds of division, okay, on the scope, that would be, say, a 100 millisecond long duration. Okay. So the frequency resolution is going to be related to that duration. So the only other wrinkle in here is this something called a window factor. Just doing a raw FFT on this data, okay, without doing any other processing on the data, uh, this window factor value would be 1. So essentially the frequency resolution would be 1 over this duration. And that's kind of a good rule of thumb, okay. But typically FFTs will apply what's called a window function. Because an FFT is kind of assuming that this sample of data that you're giving it is a representation of a continuous waveform. Okay, and problem is that the waveform doesn't end at the same spot where it begins. You get this discontinuity in the waveform, and that leads to kind of distortions in the frequency domain. So typically, a window function is applied that multiplies this signal by an envelope so that it squishes to zero at the ends, comes up, and then squishes to zero at the other end. Okay, 
And depending on, there are different window functions that are very common. Uh, and there's a couple selections in the scope to select. And those window functions will have a different window factor. Typically it's a number that's greater than one. It may be one and a half, 1.8, 2.2 things like that, but you can kind of get the idea that the frequency resolution is proportional to, or inversely proportional to the duration. The longer the duration, the finer the frequency resolution. So that's the way to think about that. Okay, so we aren't going to worry too much about what the actual window factor is that we're using. Okay, but that's essentially what you'll get. The other thing, the vertical axis in an FFT is typically uh, shown logarithmically because typically an FFT is going to show you a much wider dynamic range. Okay, so instead of showing just a linear voltage, most times the FFT will show you a dB VRMS, okay, as opposed to uh, a linear uh, voltage. And uh, you can change that on most of them as well, but that's typically what you'd get. So you get a dB voltage, a dB of the RMS voltage vertically, okay, and frequency on the horizontal axis that ranges from DC to half your sample rate and then the resolution that you get is inversely proportional to the amount of time you capture. So given that, let's set up the scope here to make some audio measurements. Okay. So what we'll do first off is I'm going to just go and hit the default setup button here so that just kind of defaults the scope to so that there's nothing wacky that's kind of left in the setup. And you'll notice uh, down here we can see the time per division, the sample rate, and the number of points. We're going to leave the number of points at 10,000. As I adjust my horizontal scale, okay, uh, I'm going to uh, ch changing the horizontal scale here. We can actually see as I knock the horizontal scale down, so I get a larger value of time per division. You can see my sample rate's coming down, right? Because I don't, I'm not, I'm essentially capturing longer record of data, so the sample rate's come, the effective sample rate of the waveform is coming down. So if we go down to something like, say, oh, 40 milliseconds of division, okay, my sample rate is 25 kilosample per second and uh, for, for those 10,000 points. Now, uh, that's actually pretty good because half of that is 12 and a half kilohertz. So if I set up my, my frequency span is going to go up to 12 and a half kilohertz, that's about the upper end of most adult hearing range, okay? And when we're younger, it's, it's a little bit higher than that, but uh, Kind of the, the audio range we're going to worry about is, is probably uh, you know, about 12 and a half kilohertz. So that's probably good. So we're going to leave ourselves at 40 millisecond division, and uh, it gives me a 12, 12 and a half kilosample per second sample rate, and the, the 12 and a half k uh, span on the FFT. So the other thing I need to do is set up the uh, vertical sensitivity to be able to pick up signals from my microphone, and I'll talk about the microphone in a moment, but. Uh, just playing around with this, I know I need to be at about 5 millivolts of division vertically here. So if we take a look, there's my vertical scale. I adjust that by just changing uh, the knob here. And you'll notice I'm going to knock that down to about 5 millivolts of division. Now if we look at the scope, I'm kind of move this waveform up a little bit. Uh, we can actually see, I'm, I'm seeing some noise here, right? Because this scope has got a gigahertz of bandwidth. Well, we're not going to use that full gigahertz of bandwidth. Uh, I can I can go turn on channel 1 and tell it to apply a... a in this case, a 20 megahertz bandwidth limit filter, and that cut the that cut the uh, the noise down quite a bit. But there's something else we can do as well. And remember, this scope natively samples at five giga sample per second. Uh, so what we're doing is, if we're only using essentially uh, in this case about 25 kilosamples per second, so there's a lot of samples that are being sampled and just thrown away. So rather than throw them away, we can put the scope into what's called high res mode. Okay. And uh, if we go to the horizontal uh, acquire menu, I push that button, uh, we can actually see the mode that the scope is in is sample. Okay, let me just hit that sample button. And then the, the selections that we have here are basically say what sample means is that it literally is that we're just going to take one sample at that sample rate and throw the rest away. Okay, but uh, what we can do is take advantage of this mode called high res. If I select high res, okay. I uh, notice that my waveform got a lot thinner, okay, a, little, a lot quieter. What that's doing is that instead of throwing away all those other samples that uh, we didn't really need, we're taking all of them as a group and averaging them together to create the one, you know, each point. So you're essentially getting a, an in situ averaging or boxcar averaging of uh, of the data. So you get a, a little bit better uh, effective number of bits and things like that. So so now we've set up the analog channel appropriately. Uh, to capture kind of this low-level audio signal. So now what we need to do is turn on the FFT. And the way we do that in the scope is we go to the math menu. So I hit the math menu. That brings up math down here along the bottom. 
And uh, if we look at the second button over, that's uh, the FFT. So I select that. Okay. And now over on the scope, we can see here's my FFT. I'm going to tell it I want to use channel one as my source. That's fine. I can see my vertical units are dB, V. Uh, so it's a dB of the RMS voltage. Here's this win window thing. So as we look here, there's actually some selections of window for Hanning, rectangular, Hanning, etc. Rectangular is like having no window at all. These Hanning, ha these other windows will cause the frequency resolution to get slightly coarser, but we're already you know, down in the single digit hertz of frequency resolution, so I think we're just fine leaving it at the default. And we can also see also now that the horizontal scale is 1.25 kilohertz per division, and that makes sense, right? We said that we had a 12.5 kilohertz total span, 10 divisions, so 12.5K divided by 10 is 1.25 kilohertz per division. So each division is going from DC to 1.25 gig, or 1.25 kilohertz, 2.5 kilohertz, 7.25, etc., etc. So, uh, so there's our um, our frequency span. So there's the FFT result of what we're looking at here. So now what we want to do is talk about getting the audio signal into scope channel one, and we could use a microphone, and that would work. Maybe it would be, you know, as long as the microphone is a, a type that doesn't need a bias and can just drive a, a resistive load like this one mega ohm resistive load of the scope input. But uh, also something that's pretty easy to do and pretty common um, that is easy to find is you can simply use a like a little speaker. Here's a little uh, 8 ohm speaker that I use for some of my ham radio things. And a speaker will work just as well as a microphone as it does as a speaker. Okay, so uh, so I'm just going to take that and couple that right into uh, the input to the scope here. And you'll notice now that as I'm speaking, you can actually see you know the waveform of my voice. And you can also see the spectrum of my voice here. So um, we can actually see that going on. So now we can actually make some measurements using that speaker as a microphone of some devices. Okay. So just as a you know, something to compare, you know, kind of an apples to apples thing, is I've got two electric drills sitting over here. Okay. And let's just look at the audio signature or the spectral signature of uh, the audio of each of those. So first one I'll grab here is this guy here. This Craftsman drill I've probably had for, oh geez, um, 25 years or more. <laughs> it's been around a while, a little bit then. And both this drill and the other one we're going to use are about the same loudness in terms of volume, but they, they do have a little bit different audio quality. So if I run this drill by the uh, speaker here, just take a look at what our, our result is on the screen. So I can see that that drill has got a lot of energy down at the lower frequency end, not so much at the higher frequency end. And we could have always paused, we could pause the instrument, you know, save that waveform to a reference waveform so we can com compare it to others. Uh, but let's take a look now at the, another drill I have. I've got this one, this is a newer drill here, this is a DeWalt, okay. This one's only about uh, five or six years old. Okay, and if I run this one here, I'll take a look at the result. And it was kind of clear from looking at that that I had a lot more energy up here, even around you know five you know five kilohertz or so that didn't exist on the Craftsman. So um, you know the only point here is that you know, this gives you a way of maybe quantifying you know where the the energy is at what frequencies, and then and you might make a determination that one device sounds better than another, sounds more pleasing than another, or one's more annoying to listen to, and by making that judgment versus what you see in the spectrum uh, for the audio of that thing, you might be able to decide uh, you know, which one is more pleasing to use and that kind of a thing. So, but anyway, this is just a quick example of uh, using an FFT in a modern oscilloscope, how to set it up and, and get uh, a good high resolution result here by using high res mode, how to get uh, you know, enough capture depth or capture length here uh, in order to give the, the frequency resolution you want and ensuring that the sample rate you know, it gives you the frequency coverage that you want in the FFT results. So anyway, I hope you found this helpful, useful, and if you have any questions, of course, uh, or any comments, I'd love to hear about them, and please uh, leave them there on the YouTube channel. And uh, thanks again for watching.